Dear listeners, dear listeners, dear listeners, I nearly forgot this bit. I nearly forgot the pre-show pundit question. Punditgames.co.uk, how about that? Uh, I was just about to edit today's show when I suddenly remembered I haven't done the question. So here we are, dear listeners, Pundit Games, the uh, the quiz game of choice on Akdung Millwall. Uh, you can pick one up for ahead of Christmas, birthdays, Sunday afternoon, lash-ups with your mates. It has all sorts of applications, but here's the question for you. The answer will be at the end of today's show. This is um, a change that we've done a couple of international questions and one really obscure Football League question so far. But this one is from the English Premier League of the 1990s. So going by the ACAST demographic charts, that should be appealing to 99.9% of my listeners here. Um, so today's question is a Leeds legend playing Leeds on Sunday. A Leeds legend who had two spells at Elland Road interrupted by stints at Blackburn and Newcastle. Part of the squad that won Leeds' most recent English title, partnering with Gary McAllister in midfield and feeding Gary Speed and Gordon Strachan on the wings. He scored one of his rare goals in this game versus Manchester City. This is dated 1991, September the 7th, Division 1, as it was still. It's Leeds 3, Manchester City 0. The Leeds team that day, minus our mystery... Or is it a mystery? You might have the answer already. Uh, our mystery personality is John Lukic in goal, backline Mel Sterling, Chris White, John McClelland, Tony DeRigo, there's a name from the past, midfield two, Gary McAllister and Mr X on the wing, Strachan and Speed up front, Rod Wallace and Lee Chapman. So who is a Leeds legend, two spells at Ellen Road, interrupted by Blackburn and Newcastle, part of the team that won the 1991-92 English Championship? Answer at the end of today's show, dear listeners. You're listening to Achtung Mool, broadcasting from the beautiful South Bermondsey. Accept no substitute. Hello, 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 dear listeners. Welcome back to Achtung Mool the number one mill podcast. My name is Nick Hart. It seems like ages since you and me spoke last, dear listener, doesn't it? It would be Birmingham, the aftermath of the Birmingham away game. One all, it finished up there at St Andrews a couple of weeks ago. The international break is purgatory. Purgatory. Seems to drift on forever, doesn't it? Um, Anyway, as it's been a long time since I last did any new content on the show, apart from the Birmingham trip, it might be nice just to pick up some notes that I did um, before the Birmingham game. I was actually going to do a preview show before that Birmingham one all draw a couple of weeks ago. And for many reasons, um, familial and private and all sorts of stuff like that, I didn't get around to making the preview show. So we've got a fixture from 1967, a Millwall win at Birmingham, which I've done some notes for, and rather than... See it all go to waste, as my dear old mum would have said. Well, I thought we'd whip it out for you in this preview show. So what's the opposite of preview? Post view. So that's a post view of the Birmingham game, a fixture from 1967 that I found. And I've also got, um, as a preview for this Sunday's game versus Leeds, I've got another fixture for you from 19. 19- 87, the Simon Cup fixture between Mill and Leeds. But first, just to run through uh, the news, I suppose, such as there is in this endless, um, neither you're neither awake nor, you know, you're neither alive nor dead. It's like the zombie period, isn't it? The, the period of the international break. But we've got Leeds coming up on Sunday, 17th of September. Sunday, bloody Sunday. Thank you very much, Sky Television. We've also got to keep it up my trip to Preston that I had lined up in October by moving the fixture. This this is obviously another Sky game this Sunday, moved to 12 o'clock on uh, at Sky's behest. And they've done the same for our trip to Preston North End in, in October 21st, I think it is. That's also been moved forwards to 12.30. Thank you very much, Sky Television. Um, did have some train tickets booked up there. I'll have to see what I can do. But this uh, Sunday's game, just by way of a preview, I thought I'd uh, just give you a few notes of the the current situation that then obviously um, we should probably be called injury hit Mill FC. Maybe that should be the the new 
official club name injury hit Millwall FC. Sean Hutchinson now injured in that one all draw up there in Bum. Brum? Up in Brum. Um, as well as uh, Matthias Sarkic in goal, also injured apparently before the Birmingham game, so according to Gary Rowett. Um, played through that match, no signs of it at the time, but um, he's injured his quad, his quad muscle. I think I've got a quad muscle underneath a layer of fat around my middle, dear listeners. Um, but yeah, uh, Hutch and Sarkic out. Question marks obviously over whether Joe Bryan will be back. Uh, speaking to the uh, London News Online, Richard Corley, Mill boss Gary Rowe says he has absolutely no qualms. It's a good word, qualms. You don't really use it very often in everyday speech, but he has no qualms about starting Bart Bielkowski against Leeds if Sarkic misses out. It remains to be seen whether Sarkic will miss out. I wonder whether this might be the old double shuffle um, story put out ahead of the, uh, the the pantomime clash that is Leeds. Always a big, big occasion, isn't it? Mill versus Leeds. That's big for them, I think, as it is for us. It's a psychological um, you know, starting point for the season, really. I, I don't know about you, dear listener, but it, it's been a very bitty start to the season. It doesn't really feel like it's got going yet for me. Um, I missed one or two games with holidays, August, all this kind of stuff, blah, blah, blah. Um, then the international break comes along. So Sunday, with the pantomime of uh, Widow Twanky and Leeds, um, it feels like it's a proper game, it's a proper start to the season. Um, with, potentially we're starting with Bart Bielkowski in goal a lot of controversy online obviously um, Bart has been written off after one very rusty performance against the Reading under 21s um, as I joked the other day on my WhatsApp group he was looked rustier than the old Datsun 120 Y that I bought in 1980 and that was a rusty car let me tell you um, but yeah Gary Rowe has no qualms about starting Bart Bielkowski, rightly so. He's a, you know, he was a player of the season not that long ago. Um, goalkeeping is a very unforgiving position, dear listeners, isn't it? You know, you have nowhere to hide. Your mistake invariably leads to a goal for the opposition, and um, you know you get the experts on the terracing and on the online. On the online, that really makes sense. But online, telling you how you should be doing your job. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna be see. Um, Connell Truman is our third choice. He's obviously untested, and this will be a huge fixture for the Lions for the club. A, a sellout. I think I saw online it was sold out, which is not bad for a noonday fixture, is it? On a Sunday, um, such as the there's a song they sing. The Leeds fans, you're on the year because it's Leeds, and, and to some extent that's true. Um, you know, it's it's they're 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 our big club. Um, fallen upon very hard times in recent years. But for me and anyone of my generation, they remain um, contenders. You know, they were European Cup contenders. They were league champions. They were Don Revy's creation. Um, and they still live in the shadow of those years, really. Never quite matched up to them ever since. But yeah, are we all only there because it's Leeds? To some extent, yes, yes, we are, dear listeners. Uh, I know I might be aggravating a few people out there saying that, but it's, it remains true whether you like it or not. Um, some international reportage. We've had uh, quite a few players away on international duty, including Sarkic, who missed out on the Montenegro um, fixture through injury. Um, but good news to report from our prospect, a very talented prospect, Idamo Imarco, who took the field late in the game, the Irish under-21 side versus Turkey in Cork. Scored a winner. Nice finish. I don't know if you've seen it on um, on Twitter or X, I should call it now, on, on the X. Uh, nice finish. 96-minute winner for Ireland. Idamo um, so clearly over the moon. And um, Gary Rowett said that he has impressed him more and more as the 2023-24 campaign has gone along. Um, he must be due a start at some point or a bigger role in, in proceedings because he didn't take part in the game at Birmingham. And if he's scoring goals, not quite at full international level, but not far short of it, then I don't know what we're looking for in a, in a season that has yet to really explode. So um, as good as the Birmingham performance was in parts, I do think that we need more Tabasco sauce in our tomato juice, so to speak. And um, the likes of Idamo, the likes of Roman Esse, Kevin Nisbet up front will be... You know, they'll be the Leon Perrins going in the old uh, Bloody Mary, won't they? That's what we need. 
dear listeners. Other caps for George Savile, Roman Essa I've mentioned already. Savile for Northern Ireland, SA for the England under-19s. Tom Bradshaw took the field for Wales um, and brought Brooke Norton Cuffey and Kevin Nisbet run new substitutes. Um, Norton Cuffey, is he, is he English? I believe he is English. So um, I imagine he's one of the England feeder sides, the under-21s or under-19s. Um, yes, indeed, there it is. The Arsenal only Brooke Norton Cuffey watched his England under-21 side defeat Luxembourg 3-0 with Kevin Nisbet on the bench for the Scottish uh, 3-1 defeat against England um, in the 150th anniversary heritage friendly. Bradshaw uh, apparently took the field for a few minutes of the Welsh win over Latvia, 2-0 win for Latvia. Uh, so, yeah, there we are. That's that's as much of a preview as really we can do for the lead. There hasn't been much action to report. The, uh, the social media feeds for well, our club, but also many other clubs, are full of filler articles about... You know, what style of shirt you like the best and um, which goal by Jimmy Abdu is best against Leeds, which, you know, stuff like that. So I thought I'd give you some quality material. Dear listen, I've got an hour to play with, so I thought I'd uh, dredge up the notes I didn't do for the Birmingham game. Um, this was a, it was meant to be a preview for the Birmingham match two weeks ago, but I'm going to use the notes anyway. So I'm looking at a fixture from September. 1967, 30th of September in actual fact. This finished uh, as a 3-2 win for the Lions and it's a bit of a comeback. Um, we came back from 2-0 down there at Burn with a late, late couple of goals to, to win it. Uh, 15th minute, 1-0 to Birmingham. Pickering, 55th minute, 2-0 to Birmingham. Uh, a player called Vincent. Keith Weller in the 71st minute pulled it back to 2-1. Um, then Tommy Wilson in the 89th minute scored an equaliser, making it two all. And then that man again, Keith Weller, in the 90th minute. Let me um, read you the side that took the field there. The amazing 3-2 win, really. It's not, generally speaking, a ground that we have an awful lot of success at. Um, so the Lions 11 that took the field in this 1967 fixture, 1967-68 season. Laurie Leslie, John Gill, Chris Dennis Burnett, Ken Jones, Barry Kitchener, Tommy Wilson, Derek Posse, Keith Weller, uh, Hunt, substitute by uh, Cripps on 67, Dunphy and Billy Neal. The 67-68 season was a season of promise in fairness. We would actually finish seventh in the table. This was um, under Benny Fenton. He started to form the side that would eventually go achingly close in the 71-72 season that we've mentioned a good few times. But this was not a, a bad season. To finish seventh in the, in the old Division 2 was was no mean achievement. Um, home, nine wins, ten draws. That's probably what let us down that season. Those ten draws at Colblow Lane, just two losses at home. Away, form wasn't so bad. Five wins, including this one we're mentioning here at Birmingham, seven draws away and nine losses. Um, 45 points for the season. The top two would be Ipswich and QPR. Top goal scorer, Keith Weller. Keith Weller. I, I never saw Keith Weller play, listeners. It's one of those um, questions you get from time to time, which player do you wish you'd seen? And he'd left Millwall by the time I started going in the early 70s. And I think I'd have to choose Keith Weller because I hear such fantastic reports about his skill and ability and his pedigree. He you know, played for England, not with Millwall, but in the previous, um, I think he played for Spurs prior to coming to the Den and he went on to Chelsea and eventually, I think most famously, Leicester, Leicester City. Quite a flamboyant figure and I would love to have seen him, but uh, never, never did. Second goal scorer for the season, Derek Posse, 12 goals. So 14 for Weller. 12 for Posse for this particular season. Um, now, I do have a match report, which I shall run through here for you. It's wonderful stuff, actually, because there's a game, obviously, which uh, I'll read here. We are Birmingham 2, Milford. There's a good story that goes with it. That's the reason I pause there, listeners. Headline is Weller on time, Birmingham 2, Millwall 3. This is a piece by Mike Beddo. I think it's in one of the uh, that's the Sunday Mirror, in the Sunday Mirror. Uh, Mill scored their first ever goals at St Andrews. Yeah, as I said, we've not had a great um, track record at Birmingham over the years. So this is our first ever goals to, that we scored at St Andrews in 1967. Um, 
but surely their predecessors have never met such a fragile Birmingham defence, says Mike Beddo. Three bad errors allowed the Lions to recover from being two goals down and snatch their third away win of the season. Two goals came in the last two minutes. Left winger Keith Weller, who scored the winner with the last kick of the match, after Tommy Wilson had equalised, was the two-goal hero of the proceedings. But even the ex-Spurs man must have been shocked by the generous way that Birmingham threw away their unbeaten home record. Um, it's all about Birmingham, this, this report, isn't it? Um, before Weller began the recovery in the 70th minute, Mill had been restricted to their familiar role of mass defence. Um, yeah, but Benny Fenton did have a bit of a reputation of being a defence defensive manager. Um, similarly to, I suppose, in the modern era, you might talk about Jose Marino in a similar style. Um, you know, I know I'm going to get some screams of anguish when I put Benny Fenton and Jose Marino in the same sentence, but there we are. Same kind of approach. Their, their philosophy was the same, shall we say. Uh, the, the report continues, yet for all the resolution of Dennis Burnett, John Gilchrist and Tommy Wilson Mill could not contain a Birmingham attack, which had scored 19 goals in six home games. Fred Pickering, Fred Pickering, and John Vincent had put Birmingham two up in 52 minutes. And then they looked set for more goals, he says. Uh, Mill barely raised a shot, although Bobby Hunt, substituted by Harry Cripps in the 67th minute, had a first minute header kicked off the line. So there we are, um, 2 0 down as late as the 71st minute of this particular fixture. Um, we then stage a comeback 2 1 on 71 via Keith Weller. Wilson equalises in the 89th minute, and then we nick it at the death of the match 3 2. That must have been a very satisfying away win. It's um, certainly uh, be very welcome to see. Something like it. But one thing that did make me laugh, I mean, there's a football report, a good football match there. But as was the, the flavour of the time, you're talking about the mid-60s now, Summer of Love. Not in Birmingham, though. No Summer of Love in Birmingham, dear listeners. Um, there's a big um, half-page report here with a fantastic photo of Eamon Dunthy. I will come back to that. Um, the headline of the article is Hippies at half-time make soccer fans angry. Uh, the beautiful people came up to the uh, Saturday people yesterday, says a Sunday Mirror reporter. This is an unnamed reporter. Um, but the result was neither love nor peace. The beautiful people were represented by four micro-skirted girls. They danced, hippie girls. They danced onto the football pitch in front of 30,576 uh, Birmingham fans who were there to watch the soccer match. At first... The cavorting girls, part of a stunt to advertise a boutique company. That's a word you don't hear very much nowadays. Kids will wonder what a boutique is. It was a funky shop where um, hippie girls would go and buy micro skirts in the in the seventies and sixties. Um, these these cavorting girls were greeted with cheers at first at Birmingham City St Andrews Ground, but then. One of the girls hoisted her dress above her waist and revealed her skin-coloured tights. Disgusting, degrading, sickening, shouted the fans. I bet they didn't shout that. <laughs> She's, she was wearing flesh-coloured uh, tights. Hippies were, well, free and easy. Free love. Um, disgusting, degrading and sickening, allegedly, shouted the fans, according to Sunday Mirror. Finally, there was a, a, a hail of yellow toilet paper. Yellow toilet paper? What have they done on it? Generally, it's white. Toilet paper throwing used to be a big thing back in the 70s, and regularly people would take a roll of toilet roll to chuck on, but it was generally white, listeners. Youngsters will need to know this. And in my experience, as a man who's been around the, the track a few times, um, you don't really see much yellow toilet paper unless you've... Um, you know, done your diddles on it already. So I don't know if that's gone on up at Birmingham. You know, all sorts of things are possible here. Um, the report continues. It does continue. It's got the Sunday papers. You've got another few paragraphs of this. Finally, there was a hail of yellow toilet paper, and it had been claimed that by the organisers of the display that the stunts would keep the fans' minds off hooliganism. So rather than fight, why don't you get involved in free love, hooligans? This would be the mid-60s. This was the beginnings, the early glimmerings of the social movement, the the kind of social scare that um, would come to be called football hooliganism that would progress through the 70s and obviously um, reach its, its zenith, I suppose you'd say, in the mid-80s with the 
Huazel disaster and, uh, you know, the various other incidents that uh, have plagued the game. Uh, Mr. David Wiseman, Birmingham's vice chairman and one of the country's top soccer administrators, watched the girls troop off the field and he said, I didn't like it at all. It won't happen again. This sort of thing might be all right for a nightclub, but not for football. No. At the match was a leading member of the team of experts set up by the sports minister to study the growing problem of soccer hooliganism. He is Dr. Norman Imler. After walking around talking to fans on the terraces, he said, the only reaction that I saw was very hostile. I don't buy this. I can't believe that for uh, gyrating, cavorting hippie girls wearing micro skirts would draw a hostile relationship from a football crowd. Um, now, I can believe this, as he goes on, this display was an amateurish show. I can believe that. I've seen some cavorting amateurish shows in my younger years. Listen, not now, I'm a married man. Um, he says it's difficult to give any serious reaction to it. Very stuffed shirt, isn't it? Oh, yeah. But I can't see the idea of mini-skirted goals reducing the instances of vandalism. Personally, I wasn't all that impressed. Hmm. Uh, the girls who danced for the soccer fans before the match and at half-time, when they named them, Maureen Bindman, Jenny Harrington, Kathy Devine, and 20-year-old Melinda Martin. The other three girls are all 19 years old. Melinda, who was Melinda, who had the, the idea of hoisting up her mini dress, bringing forth cries of disgusting from angry fans. One woman ran forward yelling, it's a disgrace to the club. A man said, I've never seen anything so sickening. I would probably say it with a Birmingham accent, but I can't do a Birmingham accent. Melinda sighed. Huh. I just want to make everybody happy, man. Take their minds off of everything. As she walked off, Maureen Bindman said, it's the first time I've ever done anything like this. I was terrified at first. Then I began to enjoy it. <laughs> oh, dear. Danny Gavin, a 24-year-old director of the boutique company, which organised the stunt, said, all my girls are all from the London hippie scene, man. They're a new type of happy-go-lucky model. Apart from the hippie dancing, there was also a football match. Millwall beat Birmingham three goals to two. Um, there's a wonderful photo. I'm going to have to stick this on with the notes um, uh, of, of Eamon Dunphy. Um, let's just say if, if the, the amount of flack that, uh, was his name, jo Jose Rubiales has drawn from the... Uh, the, the you know the media for his actions at the end of the Spanish win in the Women's World Cup. I think Eamon has been lucky to be born in a different era. He's, he's um, manhandling, woman handling, Melinda. Um, I'll stick the photo online. Now, she's got a banner there which says Fanny on it. <laughs> it's a it's a it's a it's a strange image. You've got Eamon Dunphy with his hands around her middle. She's holding a banner that says Fanny and uh, John Gilchrist is walking past looking at her thighs. Um, it's very odd. Um, there we are. Hippie, hippie chicks dancing at halftime. Should we bring this back, listeners? Would you get angry if a group of hippie chicks dressed in micro skirts from their local boutique were to um, you know try and divert your attention away from the the the, the bloodlust of uh, Mill versus Leeds. Um, do let me know. Do let me know. Uh, there we are. I think that's um, that uh, you know, is enough about that particular game. Uh, just in passing, this this was game was played in um, early October um, on the subject of hooliganism, which obviously was starting to take hold in the game, as you will have gathered by those rather um, odd moves to um, try and divert the uh, the raging hormones of the, of the of the young men in the in the crowd um, two weeks later uh, an infamous incident would take place at Colblow Lane where um, the referee Norman Burtonshaw would be um, assaulted um, after a, a home loss versus Aston Villa 2-1 home home loss to Aston Villa. He actually got chinned and then would be closed. There's a screaming headline here in the people, close the den. There's only one answer, close the den. Look at this picture and you'll see why. And there's Burton Shaw. It's not a particularly great scan of, of Burton Shaw, but he's been 
uh, carried off by a St John's ambulance man clutching his head, having been clouted. And the reason was he didn't give a penalty for Millwall late in the game. So, you know, there it is. Um, but yeah, that would that would reverberate around the club. When I started going in 72, um, there was a very small yellow fence. The, the, the club had done the bare minimum to try and escape the... Um, I think we got fined and we got ordered to take measures and they put a yellow fence that wouldn't have stopped anyone. It didn't stop anyone getting over the, onto the pitch. But it was um, the first in a series of incidents across the late 60s, early 70s, mid 70s, culminating in the 80s um, that would uh, shake the very foundations of football. But that occurred two weeks after this particular fixture, the 3 2 win away at Birmingham. Um, I just love that story about the hippie chicks and I'm going to stick this photo of Eamon Dunphy online. Um, incidentally, just a bit of social social comment. There's a part of the page on where the hippie story is is also occupied by um, the great Universal Catalogs advert, um, Autumn Fashions, as recommended by Norman Hartnell, who was uh, dresser to the Queen. This is something you just don't see anymore. I suppose online has replaced... The idea of um, catalogue shopping, um, you could, it's like a credit, I suppose, to explain it's young. So you'd get a big, thick magazine full of consumer goods. Yeah, you name it, everything was in there. I used to love looking through catalogues as a kid. Games, toys, clothes, um, you know, domestic goods, tools, anything, absolutely, literally anything. Um, and you could spread the cost as a credit arrangement and Great Universal, one of the players in that particular market. Uh, Little Woods were also players in, in the game and I suppose the Argos catalogue was a kind of a development of that in the in the 70s and then eight, especially in the 80s. But um, yeah, just one of those things, like I've said a few times during this show, um, your life becomes history at some point. This will happen to you, young listener. If you, I'm talking to you, you young listener, um, as as hip and as happening as the internet is right now, the point will come where your hip and happening will seem as stale as my talk here about the great universal catalogue and the hippie chicks. It will seem like a different world. Um, front page, you do the front page before I close on this one. Not big picture of um, Engelbert Humperdinck on the front page doing some kind of link-up story with a book called The Naked Ape, which was by Desmond Morris. And I think it is sought to, the book, sought to explain uh, human behaviour in terms of the um, the ape world from which we spring. And I don't know what Engelbert Humperdinck has to do with that, but they've linked The Naked Ape with Engelbert, who was a sex symbol, and some girls sitting at his knees screaming. Maybe that's the uh, the mating kind of rituals of young girls at that time. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, that's the front page of the Sunday Mirror. What's Engelbert got to do with the naked, naked ape is the is the is the headline. Achtung, Mailball. So I'm going to move along. That was my opposite of preview, post view for Birmingham. A little bit of history there for you, listeners. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, now, as I said already, our game against Leeds is the next fixture, and I'm trying to find a fixture that. Um, you know, matched it date-wise. You can't find it, so I've given up on that idea. I've matched one, just caught my eye, it caught my interest. Um, it's a strange little competition um, from 1987, the 8th of December, Mill 2, Leeds United, nil in the Simod Cup, the Simod Cup, second round game played at Cobble Lane in front of just 5,034. Uh, the Simod Cup was a... Um, also known as the Four Members Cup, which was a, a, a cup set up for the top two divisions in the aftermath of the uh, loss of European football, which occurred in the aftermath of uh, a lot of aftermaths. Uh, in, in the wake, let's go with that, it's in the wake of the Heysel Stadium disaster, Liverpool fans killing 50 uh, Italian fans from Juventus in the European Cup final. Um I don't know if we were banned. I think we voluntarily took a ban, didn't we? I don't can't remember which way round it went now. But for one reason or another, uh, English clubs were not able to play in European competition for about five years at the end of the late 80s. And by way of 
some form of recompense. Uh, the the, the Simod Cup, the full members cup was set up for the top two divisions as an alternative method of winning some silverware and playing at Wembley. Um, there's still an echo of it in that the, the bottom two divisions um, got the uh, the Associate Members' Cup, which we would um, get the, the uh, final of in, uh, is it 90, 1998, 1999? Uh, Mill made the uh, Auto Windscreen Shield Cup, which is the sponsored name of the bottom two division tournament which hung on, that one cling, clings on now, the, the Football League trophy clings on now, even though they're using it as a kind of, um, you know, under-21s workout for the big clubs. Uh, that still clings on. The Associate Members Cup died, I believe it was in the in the 90s. I haven't checked that, so take that with a pinch of salt, listeners. But anyway, the 87-88 Full Members Cup, known as the Simod Cup after the Italian... Uh, sportswear company, which still exists apparently. I, I was looking just out of curiosity because I hadn't seen the word Simod since the um, the the sponsored competition back in the eighties, and I haven't seen it around. Have, have you ever worn Simod, dear listener? I haven't, and I, apparently it still exists, but it doesn't seem to be particularly active. So I don't know if it's gone into some kind of comatose state. Um, but the competition itself would um, be one by Reading in a final played at Wembley versus Luton Town. Um, that was played the 27th of March, 1988. This particular fixture that I'm mentioning here um, was a 2-0 win for the Lions uh, over Leeds. We would then go out in the third round, the next round again, with a 3-2 home loss versus Norwich City. Um, the previous round had seen an infamous fixture, which was the... Uh, away game at Upton Park against West Ham. I will I will mention that was. A, I'm just looking through the match reports here. I've got to talk about the game that I'm I've actually found here. There isn't a huge amount of reportage from this win. Um, the Mill team just uh, just to dig out the the side that took the field against Leeds this particular game. Then we'll come on to the match report. Uh, Brian Horn in goal across the back line. We've got Dennis Salman, Alan Walker. Remember him. I didn't mind him. He used to get slaughtered by people on the halfway line, Walker. Um, he was substituted by Steve Wood in the 85th minute. Um, Adam McCleary, Nicky Coleman. Now, I put this, set this team up in a 4 4 uh, four three three. It might have been 4 4 2. I don't know. But anyway, I've got 4 3 3. I've got Keith Stevens in midfield, Terry Herlock, Les Briley. Um, it might have been a 4 4 2. It might have pulled George Lawrence back to, onto the wing. I don't know. Might have pulled Carter back onto the wing, but up front we've got George Lawrence, Teddy Sheringham, and Jimmy Carter. George Lawrence replaced by Darren Morgan in the 37th minute. Um, two goals, one by Walker, one nil on the in the 35th minute, and then to seal the match, Teddy Sheringham in the 76th minute with, uh, with the second. Um, the briefest of reports in the Daily Mirror, dated December the 9th, Wednesday, 1987. Uh, Tony Cascarino, Mills' leading goal scorer, will be out of the action for at least a month with a broken rib. Now the race is on to get him fit for the glamour third round FA Cup tie at Arsenal on January the 9th. That will be a game played at Highbury in January 1988. But Mill didn't miss him last night as they beat Leeds 2-0 in the second round of the Simod Cup at the den with goals from Alan Walker and Teddy Shearing, as we've mentioned already. Um, now, the, the, the previous round had seen an infamous fixture, which was a, a win um, for the Lions at West Ham, Upton Park. We've mentioned the hooliganism a few times. <laughs> this is not a hooligan show. I, you know, I'm, I'm a lover, not a fighter, listeners. Um, but anyway, you, no Mill fan can spend any time at the club without at least an awareness of that as part of the fabric of Mill life. Um, this report here for the previous round fixture, West Ham won Mill 2, which took place in, in October 87, just describes a massive a massive police operation which turned Upson Park into a no-go area last night as West Ham crashed out of the Simod Cup. Can you crash out of the Simod Cup? I suppose you can. 400 coppers on duty for this particular fixture instead of the usual 130. And 40 arrests, 40 arrests made in the hostile atmosphere whilst two police helicopters circled overhead. Bear was in the air. Two bears were in the air. 
the Hammers ran into Bother on the field as well as they were bundled out of another cup by second division opposition. Um, Barnsley haven't really knocked them out of the Little Woods Cup last month, but on this game, occasion, Mill hit back to end their interest in what used to be called the Four Members Cup. T- Tony Cascarino and then Teddy Sheringham struck within two minutes of each other to overtake Alan Dickens's 60th minute opener. So anyway, that was the previous round. So the game that I'm talking about here is a 2-0 win for Millwall over Leeds in front of 5,000 at Colbelow Lane. I uh, picked out two players just to mention two. I don't think we've mentioned Alan Walker many times in these these particular shows that um, that we do. Um, if we have, I can't remember it. But anyway, Alan Walker, centre-half. Like I said, I used to like Walker. Um, like many players, they, some players are just loved and some are loathed at the den. For some reason, the people where I used to stand on the halfway line had it in for Alan Walker. Um 114 games for Mill across 13 goals. I'm quoting from the Mill Who's Who book, Neil Fissler and 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 others. Um great work. Do get the latest version when, when he's done it. Played as a centre half, Alan Walker, 1985 to 1988. As I say, 13 goals from 113 appearances. Um a career spanning such clubs as Stockport, Bangor, City, Telford. Lincoln, the Lions being probably the highlight of his career, really. Uh, Gillingham, Plymouth, uh, management him before going on to management at uh, Fisher and St. Leonard's and non-league Tunbridge Angels. Um, The little bio describes Alan as a highly efficient and commanding figure. He helped Telford win the FA Trophy in 1983 before Lincoln gave him a chance to resurrect his league career at the age of 23. Uh, George Graham signed him from the Imps, and he went on to become a regular for much of the season that saw the Lions win the second division title in 1988. But he lost his place with the club on the cusp of promotion and moved to Gillingham. Uh, Alan Walker settled in Kent and has worked, has worked as head of coaching for the Kent County FA and is now a Blackburn Rovers scout. I used to like him. There we are. Um, he, wasn't, he would have lost his place, of course, to Steve Wood. Um, and that would have, um, you know, in terms of defensive ability, no, there's a, there was a clear contrast between uh, Wood and and, uh, and, uh, and and Walker. Uh, the second player I've picked out, we've mentioned another favourite, really was a favourite, Chicken George, George Lawrence, um, forward, 36 games, not much really, I think he got injured, didn't he, Chicken George, um, 87 to 89, 36 games, five goals, um, he was a figure in the early period of the, uh, you know, the first division days, um, but injury really blighted his time at the Den. In all honesty, uh, born in in London in 1962, his career took in Southampton, where he's most famous, I think, Oxford, Southampton again, Millwall, and then on to Bournemouth, um, and like Finnish football, and then non-league Hibernian played for. Hibs in Scotland in 1993, finishing uh, Rushton and Diamonds. There's a name that's disappeared, 1997. And Howes Owen, 1998. Uh, the bio says Chicken George. Chicken is a great nickname. Chicken George came from the TV series Roots. Alex Haley, that was one of the characters, Chicken George. Stuck with George for some reason. Um, Chicken George had been part of the Oxford United squad who had won the third division title in 83-84, and Lions boss John Doherty lured him to the den following a long and drawn-out battle. After being forced out onto the wide right because of Teddy Sheringham and Tony Cascarino, George helped win the club promotion to the first division for the only time in its history. Um, after two injuries affected, after two injury affected seasons in New Cross, he returned to the south coast over, now based in Greenford. George has been a player's agent and he's worked in the container business and driven buses. There we are. That's a... Players back then had a different life, uh, finished driving a bus. Um, Mill versus Leeds. We've done got a bad record at home to Leeds anyway. We tend not to travel there very well and they tend not to travel to us very well as a generality. Uh, played 21, won 14 in, and drawn three, lost four. That's including various uh, similar, two similar cup matches and a rather famous League One playoff win. Um, so, yeah, 14 wins over Leeds in all comps, four losses and three draws. Last time we played them, uh, 5th of October 2019, under Adam Barrett. 
That was a 2 1 win. Remember that one? 16,311. Jed Wallace scoring a penalty in the 16th minute, and then Tom Bradshaw in the 45th minute. So there we are. Um, that's the preview show for Mill versus Leeds on Sunday and the post view uh, using up my notes from the Birmingham trip. I hope you've enjoyed these little glances at the past. I enjoyed doing them. I had an hour to spare, so I thought I'd fill it up with whatever I can come up with from those notes that I never got to use previously. So there we are, dear listeners. Um, I will be back on Sunday. Uh, we're going to do our usual coverage of the, the Leeds fixture. And I think we're at home again after that to Rotherham. I think it's the Wednesday night. So a couple of shows looming up soon. Um, it's good to talk to you again. I miss talking to you. It's been uh, been ages, hasn't it? It seems like ages. Anyway, the season is now back up and running proper. So uh, until the next edition of Achtung Millwall, it's a River Dirty Millwall. Bye for now. Welcome back, dear listeners. The answer to our punditgames.co.uk question earlier on, a Leeds legend with two spells, Ellen Road, stints at Blackburn and Newcastle, member of the championship team, 91-92, partnering Mal- Mac- Gary McAllister in midfield. It was, of course, you knew it already, didn't you? It's David Batty, the Bisto kid. David Batty, the question from punditgames.co.uk. Do visit the website. It's a great football-based quiz game. Christmas looms. Get on it, dear listeners. Get on it.